We pick back up this week where we left off last week. I want you to take your Bible where you are, and I want you to turn back to the book we were in last week, 1 Chronicles chapter 4. And we're going to be looking at two verses, verses 9 and also verse 10. And this morning, I usually like to read NIV or sometimes I like New King James Version, but I want to take it old school with us. I'm going to read out of the KJV, the King James Version, all right? So bear with me if I stumble. It says this, starting, and I'm just going to read verse 10 out of it. And Jabez called unto the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that thou wouldest bless me indeed, and enlarge my coast, and that thine hand might be with me, and that thou wouldest keep me from evil, that it may not grieve me. And God granted him that which he requested. Turn to the person next to you and tell him, God is making me mega. You can take your seats where you are today. I want to jump right into where we picked off last week. And that was talking about the person of the name of Jabez. We picked up last week and we talked about the person who called out to God. We talked about the first request that he made to God, but he said that there's a few more things that he asked of God. The first thing that we talked about last week, if you weren't here, we talked about how Jabez came from what seemed to be a unfavorable circumstances, and that was that he was named Jabez, which means pain or sorrow. This was the name his mother gave him when he came into the world. This was a jacket, a label that he had to face as he went on through his journey of life. And the Bible says that instead of accepting the label, he called out to the God of Israel. He said a prayer that transformed his life forever. And in that prayer, there's five things that he said the first thing that we talked about last week is he asked God to bless his life. And the second thing that he asked God, as we want to pick up today, is he asked God to enlarge his territory. He called out to God and he said, God, I want you to bring expansion to my life. I want you to bring expansion to what's in my hands. I want you to bring expansion to the things I own, the possessions I have, the things you have entrusted with me, I don't want them to stay small. I want them to grow. He said, I don't want to be small. I want to be mega. I want the God of mega to make me mega. I want more responsibilities. I want more blessings. I want more growth in my life. He asked God to bring growth. But how many of us know that when we ask God to bring growth to us, God has to bring growth in us? See, sometimes we, we want blessing that we're not prepared for. And we want growth that God could bring. But if we're not ready for the growth that God could bring to us, it'll hurt us more than help us. You know, sometimes you see people step into a, a, a blessing that they weren't ready for. And rather than being a blessing to them, it brings damage to them. We see that happening all throughout when someone has an inheritance that they give a son that was unprepared for it. And rather than bring forth the purpose that the parents intended for that next generation, it didn't bring forth the purpose that they wanted. It brought pain that they didn't want to happen in their life because they were not ready for the growth that was going to step into their season. And I believe as Jabez called out to God and he said, God, bring expansion to my life. God had to bring expansion in his life. God had to grow him so that he could be able to be a growing leader and that he would be able to grow the things that God entrusted unto his life. See, when it comes to growth, it's important to recognize that the growth that God wants to bring through us and the growth that God wants to bring in us all starts right here. Under that nice haircut you got. Under that nice hairstyle you got, ladies. Inside of that mind... How large is your mentality? How big do you think or how small do you think? Will determine the growth that you experience in your life. 
The way that we think sometimes, I think, is offensive to God. How we could think most so small about the, the ability of God or the, the blessing of God or, or how God could come through in circumstances that seem bigger than us. And we could think small sometimes even about what God wants to do through our lives and through the disciples that God brings in our journey or the, or the people that God wants us to influence. Sometimes if our mind is small and our mentality is small, God will be unable to use us in a great way. And that's why it's important that us in our life, we let God grow this mentality of ours. You know, I've learned that if you want to grow your mentality, you got to get around someone who has a bigger mentality than you. And if you want to have your mentality stay the same, stay around small-minded people. Small-minded people will always try to get you to think like them. They want you to remain in a box. They want you to stay on their level. They don't want to see you exceed. They don't want to see you grow. As a matter of fact, they get scared seeing you get blessed. They get jealous. They get envious because they have a small-minded scarcity mentality. But when you're around someone who has a big mentality, they won't let you stay at the same place that you are. They won't let you think small. When you start thinking small, they'll remind you how big God is. When you start thinking small about a situation, they'll remind you how great God is. They'll remind you of scripture. They'll remind you of the word. They'll remind you of the power of God. And they'll begin to work on that mentality of yours. I could be honest with you. When I stepped under our apostle, Pastor Sonny, I thought I had a big mentality. I had a big head, but I had a small mentality. He began to work on my mind and say, why do you think like that? Why do you think small? Why, why do you think in the way you think? Why, why do you think in, in, that God is unable? He began to shape and form my mind that I could begin to believe God for bigger and greater things. And I could recognize in my life that the reason why I stood at the same place for so long in many different areas, financially and growth and in any area of life, is because my mentality was not ready to take me into the next season. You know that that's why you get a raise in pay is because you got a higher level of mentality. That's why people get promotions and jobs because their mentality begins to go to new levels. And you get more reward on your life because the mentality growth will bring forth growth within your life. Can you say amen to that today? And I recognize like Jabez called out to God and he asked God to expand his territory that there were enemies that were going to come and try to kill the growth that was going to step into his life. There are some growth killers that I want to talk to you about here this morning that will stunt the growth that God wants to bring to you. The first growth killer I'm able to see is the growth killer by the name of experiences. See, sometimes many of us have so many experiences in life, and some of them motivate us, but some of them hurt us. Some of us, we have experiences of the past, the failures, and I'm not really going to hit that too much here today because I know we hit that a lot, but I want to talk to the experiences that hurt you, not in the area of failure, but in the area of success. Mm -hmm. Some of us, rather than being limited by the experiences of failure, we become limited by the experiences of our success. And sometimes... I've heard a champion say who lost his, all of his belts recently. He said, don't ever let failure get to your heart and don't ever let success get to your head. And I heard him say that and it became so real to me how sometimes we get a little bit of success and it goes all to our head. And, and we have a few victories under our belt. We have a few wins under our belt. And all of a sudden we think we're the undefeated champion of the world. And rather than staying in a student of a posture that got us into the level of success, we think we're the teacher. We think we're the teachers of teachers. And we step into a room and we no longer have a, a, a posture of a student. And we no longer have the ability to learn. And so our experiences become a growth killer in our life. I get blessed when I see older people having the willingness to submit under younger people. You know, that was an area in my life I had a shift in myself because I would submit under leaders who I thought were, were, were the best leaders in the world. 
And I, and I wouldn't submit under some leaders that I've seen flaw, error, or mistakes in, and I'd say, no, he's not perfect. I'm not going to submit under him. I've been around longer than him. I know the ministry longer than him. And I took the God factor out of discipleship. I read the Bible. I could find young kings leading nations. Eight-year-old leading a nation. I find 13-year-olds leading a nation. I find young leaders. Jesus was what? In his 30s. He had people in his teenage and 20 years turning the world upside down. There's a God factor in the area of discipleship. Say amen to that today. That's why when God puts a leader over me, I will submit under that leader. It doesn't matter what function of the church I find myself in. I'm going to honor them, not because of who they are necessarily, but because the position and the mantle God placed on their shoulders. And when you could submit like that, when you can get under like that, you know what? You're going to reap what you sow. If you can't get under, nobody's going to be able to get under you. Oh, you're getting quiet. You you want to talk about that right now. I don't know how we got there. That was not here. But nonetheless, being someone who know it all, who knows it all, could hurt you in your journey. It could hurt you in your growth. I feel in my heart that I want to be a learner until the day I die. I want to die with the white belt on me. That I died a beginner. I died a learner. I, to the very last breath of my days, I want to learn from every single person who I come encounter with. I want to remain in the posture of a student. I want to remain leaning and growing from all the people God brings in my journey. Because I don't want to stunt the growth that God wants to bring in me and the growth that God wants to bring through me. I want to encourage your life here today. To stay a learner. Be a student. Let God teach you. Let God instruct you. Let God bring growth to you so that you could be used in the next season. You could be used in the next years. You could be used for the rest of your life. The moment you stop learning is the moment that you stop leading. And I think it's important that we never allow success to get to our head. Can you say amen and clap your hands to that here today? I think a model of that is Pastor Sonny and Sister Julie. They've got more experiences probably than all of us added up together here today. But they say we're learning. We're growing. We have experience, but we want new experiences. Stay a learner. Second thing I find is a growth killer is not only your experiences, but also your emotions. Mm Mm-hmm. Some people, they want growth, but they're so emotional that they can never get growth in their life. And because when they begin to advance and things go good, they keep going forward. But when things don't work in their favor, they take their toys and run away. They want microwave growth. They want things to happen at the snap of the finger. Because they're trained like that in this generation, everything is quick. Instagram is quick. Snapchat is quick. FaceTime audio, I love it, is quick. Everything is fast. Everything is fast. Everything is quick. We're in such a fast-paced society. I'll tell you something. God does not conform to our society. And we need to learn that God's timing is always perfect. God is never, ever, ever late. He's always on time. He will always show up in the right moment, in the right season, even though sometimes you want him to come earlier. You're going to thank him later. He didn't come when you wanted him to come because it would have messed everything up. Because he's on time, but because he's faithful, but because he sees more, knows more than we could see or know, he will come on time. Don't let your emotions get the best of you. Don't be driven by emotions. I choose as a young man not to be driven by my emotions. I choose to be driven by my values and my principles. Emotions will take you up and down, but values will take you forward. Values, hear me, will define your yeses and they will define your noes. 
Your emotions will take you left, right, and up and down. But your values and your principles will move you forward. I have a value active in my life that I'm going to be in God's house till the day that I die. You can't take me out of that value. It doesn't matter what's coming my way, how I feel, how I'm pressed, what I have on my shoulders, what I have on my mind. I'm going to show up on a Sunday morning. I'm going to show up on a Wednesday night because there's values in principles that I abide and live by. What drives you here this morning? What do you have? What values do you have steering you and navigating you in life? I think it's important we are value-driven people here today. You got principles. You have values that keep you stable, keep you moving, keep advancing. And I think that preaches louder than any emotional message you can give to anybody. Is people who are consistent, people who are persistent, people who will give themselves to the work that God has called them to. We should never be driven by emotions. We should never allow emotions to to get us to to make wrong decisions. I could be honest with you here this morning, and I'm going to be transparent. When I before I came to Jesus, I was an emotional wreck. I wasn't a crybaby. I wasn't somebody who who let my emotions show on the exterior, I held them on the interior. You know, I kind of lived in in a life of, in the street life, and I kind of engaged in things where you got to hold the composure, where, where you never show weakness, you always show strength. You never show that you're down some, you never show that you're scared. And I'd walk around all proud all the time, I'd walk around like everything was good, and I would walk around like I'm the man of the town. I'm being real today. Some of you, you're looking at me funny. You know what I'm talking about. But on the inside, I was an emotional wreck. On the inside, I was damaged. On the inside, I had areas in my life that had been going on for years because at the age of 13 years old, I I lost the presence of a father in my life. The most I'd see of my dad is maybe get a letter on a birthday, and if I was five years old, I'd get $5 bills. Maybe I'd miss six years old, seven year old, eight year old, or eight year old, I'll get an eight dollar, eight dollars. I was gonna say eight dollar bill, don't make no eight dollar bill. Five dollar bill, two dollars and four quarters. And that was the most that I would see from my father, and, and, and I had to learn, and it was something that was a wrong decision that I made, is rather than, than really, you know, letting God work on me, I would cut everything off. I had a habit of cutting off everything in my life. I like to say it like this, and I brought this to maybe help illustrate it, is I had some of these on me all day. I had some of these. And if I didn't like something, I would just cut it off. I cut emotions off, say, well, it is what it is. I'm going to grow up without a dad. I'm not going to have my mom and my dad together. I see everyone at school have that. But that's not me. Let me just cut that emotions off. And I developed this thing in my life where I carried these around everywhere I went. I would cut off everybody and anybody who rubbed me the wrong way. I would find someone who would not talk to me the way I wanted to be talked to, and I'd cut them off. If somebody disrespected me, I cut them off. If somebody didn't treat me the way I wanted to be treated, I cut them off, and I cut them off. And everybody that would not give me what I wanted, I'd cut them off of my life. I'd carry these scissors everywhere I went, and I thought that they were benefiting my life when really they were hurting my life. I thought that they were the answer to my problems. I thought they were the solution to my emotions that I was encountering. I thought that these scissors were good for me. But when I came to work with Pastor Sonny, he began to deal with an area in my life. The apostle identified. He said, I see something in you. You cut everybody off. He said, if they don't treat you how you want to be treated, you just cut them off. You carry a big pair of scissors around. My scissors are bigger than this. This the biggest I can get today. (laughs) My scissors are giant. But he told me, you got to turn your scissors in. 
He said, you have to turn those scissors in. You're not meant to be a killer. You're meant to be a healer. He said, you need to stop cutting people off and finding out how you could cut them off of your life and find out how you could include them in your life. Find out how you could mend the situations that have been broken. Find out how you could bring healing to a problem that seems unfixable. Find out how you could mend the relationship that you feel is irreparable. Find a way to bring healing rather than to cut everybody off that rubs you the wrong way. He told me, throw those scissors away. Some of you, that's your message here today. It's time to turn your scissors in. You cannot advance in growth in life if you just cut everybody off of your life. You know, it's reality that sometimes being discipled, it hurts. It don't feel good not hearing what you want to be told to you. It doesn't feel good when someone deals with an area in your life. It doesn't feel good when someone exposes the areas that nobody wants to talk about to you. But I thank God for leaders who impart into me. I thank God for leaders who don't let me stay the same. I thank God for men in my life who will hold me to my character, who will anchor me to my promises. I thank God that I've had leaders who deal with me. And I've made a decision not to cut them off no more. And I think for some of us, this is something real. You need to turn your scissors in. Stop cutting people off based off of a moment you encountered. You know, I've had to realize that in relationships, I can't base someone off of a situation. I need to base it off of the entirety of the relationship. Because sometimes I'm going to mess up and say something you don't like. But don't just define me by a moment. Look at the totality of our relationship. If I knew that a long time ago, there'd be so many people I'd still have in the room with me, so many people I still have in the corner with me. But I came to let you know this morning, God doesn't want you cutting people off no more. God positioned you with people who are going to help you grow. He brought you to Third Wave LA. He brought you around some people who are growing. He brought you around some leaders who are going to help you grow. And it's important that you include them in your life. And not cut off people who are sent to help you. But I do think it's important sometimes you cut off some people who are meant to harm you for a season. Sometimes some people in our life, you know, God needs to work on them in in their area. Amen. What I want to talk about is not cutting off the people who are going to bring growth to you. Not letting your emotions get the best of you. And cutting off people who God intended for your journey. Another area that I find is a growth killer, and this is a big one, is excuses. You look at the most successful people in life, people who grew the biggest businesses, you look up their upbringing, you'll find that if anybody could have made excuses, it was them. All of them came up from hard lifestyles. All of them came up from rough upbringings. All of them came up from unfavorable circumstances. But nonetheless, they chose not to make an excuse. They chose to set an example. You you choose for your life. Will you make excuses or will you decide that you want to set an example? (laughs) I think you need to get a trash can for all those excuses you've been making. I love what the leader told me. I'm going to bring you a trash can for all your excuses. Spiritual trash can. And I said, man, I don't want to live like that no more. I could make an excuse about why I'm not being the right man or why I'm not growing my ministry, why I'm not growing my business, why I'm not growing my, 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 my lineage, whatever it may be that I have. I could make excuses or I could set an example. What about you here this morning? Are you done making excuses? I want to let you know something about excuses. They could fool a lot of people, but they will never fool God. That one hurts real bad because I made some excuses and they were very logical. They were very good excuses. But in reality, no matter how good the excuse is, no matter how many people believe it, God and I know that he knows the truth of every situation. And he knows that 
he could see everything that I have, every opportunity that I have, every, every time that he's willing to empower my life and do something in my life. And I make the choice to make an excuse or I make the choice to trust him to empower me. And I believe he's going to hold every one of us accountable here today with every gift that he's given us, every skill he's put in your life, every opportunity he's placed before you. We all will give an account. And I pray that we don't come to heaven with a bunch of excuses. Come on, somebody give God praise if that's not going to be you here today. God is positioning us this morning to be people who expand our territory, who enlarge our capacity, who find our skill and begin to develop it and begin to use it. And I believe in this place, this is an atmosphere conducive for us to become mega. The third thing he asked God is not only to enlarge his territory and to bless him, but he said, let your hand be with me. He wanted God's hands on his life. He says, keep your hand upon me. And when I looked up the definition of that word, you come to find out the word used for hand defines an open hand. It defines a hand indicating power, but also direction. In the Bible, we always see the right hand of God as the hand of power. But as he's using this word here today, it's not only one of indicating power, but it's also one indicating that he wanted direction in his life. He wanted God to lead his life, to lead his journey, to lead him in his decision making, to lead him in his family, to lead him in every single decision that he made. Every door he walked through and every door he didn't walk through was going to be defined by the hand of God leading his life. If you let God, he will lead you by his hand. I know Google Maps gets you places quick and Waze gets you there quicker. But God's hand will always get you there safer. God's hand is a hand that you could trust. God's hand is a hand that will take you to become the best you you ever thought you could be or dreamt you could be. But sometimes we don't like the hand of God. I don't feel good sometimes. But I want to let you know that you could trust the hand of God in your life. I hope that we have people like that, that we say, I want God's hand upon me. You ever, you ever hear someone say that? Like, Man, that guy's anointed. You can see the hand of God on him. You ever hear that? We say that. Oh, the hand of God is on that woman. She seems powerful. Well, I think the hand of God wants to be on us, not just to stand and be anointed to be used, but also to be directed in our life. Let his hand direct your life. He said, I want your hand upon me. And he said, number four, is he asked God to keep him from evil. And the King James Version, he says, that thou wouldest keep me from evil. He knew that because he was getting so blessed and things were going so good for his journey, they would be so good for his journey that the enemy was going to have a pity party about how much he was getting blessed, that the enemy would seek to destroy that which God began to bless him with. So he said, God, I want you to put a restraining order on the devil. He said, God, I want you to keep me away from evil. I want you to keep the evil one away from me. God, I don't want these blessings to become bondages in my life. He recognized that blessing was going to come, and when blessing shows up, the enemy also shows up. The Bible says that I set a table before you in the presence of your enemies. So whenever you got a new enemy coming up to you, God is getting a table ready for you. But it's important that you're able to discern when the enemy wants to take your meal, the enemy wants to take your blessing, the enemy wants to take you out of God's purpose for your life. It's important that you could identify my enemy is trying to creep up this way. My enemy is trying to break in that way. He's trying to show up in this friendship. He's trying to show up in this temptation. He's trying to show up in this trial. And you could identify when the enemy is at your doorstep. And like Jabez, you could tell God, keep me away from evil. I want to remain in your will. I want to remain in your purpose. I want to remain in your plan. I want to remain in the blessing. So keep me from evil. 
I say this, when approached with evil, there's two things you need to identify. You need to identify your enemy, and you also need to identify your exits. See that back there? Look over there. It's an exit sign above the door. It's lit up. So you know if anything crazy happens in here, you know where to go to. There's exit signs. They're lit up right there. They're lit up in certain corridors of the building to let you know when things get hectic, you have an escape route. I love what the scripture says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. It says, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to man. But God is faithful and he will always provide a way out for you to endure it. God says, I got exit doors for you. In every temptation, in every battle, it's never too hard. It's never too strong. Every temptation of the enemy is limited. The trial is limited. And God also has opened up exit signs and exit routes for you to not fall into the temptations of the snare of the enemy. But we need to be people who say, God, I want to be away from evil. I want to identify my enemy, and I want to identify my exits. Do you know your exits when the enemy tries to take you out of God's will? Some of our exits is a phone call to a leader. Some of our exits is a scripture we read in the Bible. We quote that thing, and it's a weapon against the enemy. Some of us, are, our, our exit is showing up on a service. Our exits connecting with somebody we know we need to connect with. Identify your exits so that you can stay away from evil. Can you say amen here this morning? The last thing that he said as we all stand here this morning. Last thing he said is keep me from causing pain. His name meant pain when his mom gave birth to him. His name meant sorrow. His name meant that he would bring harm to people he came encounter with, harm to areas that he got involved with. And it blows my mind how when he prayed to God, God did not change his name. Because if you know God, he's a name changer. When he don't like someone's name, he says, you're not Abram, you're Abraham. You're not, what does he say? You're not Simon, you're Peter. Come on, what other names you got? Come on. Jacob to Israel. He's a name changer. But God did not change his name. What I like to, what I recognize is that God allowed him to change the perception when people say his name. God allowed him to redefine the meaning of his name. People thought that he was sorrow. People thought that that name meant sorrowful, painful. But little did they know, that name got a new definition through his life. It didn't mean sorrowful no more. By the time Jabez was done with that name, that name meant successful. You know what happened in the Bible? In, 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 in 1 Chronicles 2.55, it says that there was a city by the name of Jabez. And it was a city dedicated to scribes. The smartest people in community studied there. They wouldn't name a city after pain and sorrow if it was a place of excellence and growth and a place where successful people gathered together. What happened in his day is he brought new definition to the meaning of his name. When you stepped in the third wave LA, when they heard your name, they thought something crazy. When they heard your name, they thought someone who wasn't going to amount to much. When they heard your name, they thought of somebody who was going to be a statistic. They thought of somebody who was going to be the same person than they first met them in. But I came to speak this morning that you, by the power of the Holy Spirit, are redefining the meaning of your name. People don't know me by the name that they knew me by when they first met me because Jesus got on the scene. Because the name changer stepped into the room because Jesus Christ. Christ entered into my life. They don't know me by the name they used to know me by. What do they think about when they hear your name? What do people perceive when they see your name, when they pick up a phone call from you? God is shifting the perception of the way people perceive you. I believe we're talking to some people 
who God isn't going to change our name, but he's allowing, by the power of his Holy Spirit, us to redefine the meaning of our name. And I believe there's a lot of people who are looking up to you. I believe like Jabez, God is, is turning a page in our lives. Jabez started out shameful. God made him honorable. He started out with shame, but at the end of God was done with him, he was a person of honor. It says he was more honorable than all of his brothers. He elevated amongst everybody around him. Because he was a person who asked God these very things that I believe we're going to ask him here this morning. You know, Jabez sought God on his own. We have the ability to seek God together here today. What we want to do this morning is if you feel like Jabez, you want God to bring expansion, you want to be made mega, then I want you to come to the front here today. I want to challenge you. Get out of your seat and let's pray together here this morning. This is a place of prayer. This is a place where I believe God is going to redefine the meaning of some of our names. Hey, this is Brittany here, and we want to thank you for tuning in to Third Wave LA YouTube channel. We pray that this message has spoken to you, and what we want you to do right now is to make sure you like, subscribe, and share this link to someone that will also be impacted by this message. Also, if you want to stay up to date with what's taking place at Third Wave LA, make sure you subscribe to all of our social media platforms. This is Third Wave LA, where hope is found and purpose is lived out.